Good afternoon, everyone. Today we will have uh, uh, the third talk of the uh, Australian Postgraduate Audio the Colloquium by Saul Friedman, uh, the non commuting, non generating graph, an intersectional graph of a group. Uh, thank you, Saul. We can begin. Thank you, JV. And thank you to all the organizers of the colloquium for the opportunity to speak. So, yes, in this talk, I'll be speaking about two graphs defined on a group the non commuting, non generating graph and the intersection graph. And the first graph will be the focus of most of the talk. And towards the end, I'll speak a bit about the second. And I'll note that some of the results in this talk, I will mention which are joint work with my supervisors, that is my PhD supervisors, Kova Renu Dougal and Peter Cameron. So before defining these graphs, I'd like to um, introduce some concepts in the context of a very well-studied graph called the generating graph. Throughout the talk, G would denote a group. It could be finite or infinite in general. And the generating graph of G has vertices, the non-identity elements of G, the two vertices joined by an edge, if and only if they generate the group. Okay, so let's look at the example where G is the Rahiro group of order 12, that is the group of symmetries of a regular hexagon generated by two elements, A of order six and B of order two. So here is the generating graph of D12. We see that for example, A and B are joined by an edge because of course they generate G whereas A and A to the fifth are not joined because they generate a cyclic subgroup of G, which of course is a proper subgroup. We also have some isolated vertices. In particular, A cubed is isolated because it's central in G, and so it cannot generate the non-abelian group G with any other one element from the group. Now some more basic graph theoretic definitions. This graph is not connected. A connected graph is one where there's a path between any vertice, any pair of vertices along edges in the graph. But here, for example, there's no path between A squared and B, so the graph is not connected. However, the non-isolated vertices do form a connected component. In other words, a subgraph that is maximal among all connected subgraphs. Now, I haven't written this definition on the slide, but the distance between a pair of vertices in a connected component is the length of the shortest path between them. For example, A and B have distance one, whereas A and A to the fifth have distance two, because they're not joined by an edge, but we can go from A to AB to A to the fifth. And the diameter of a connected component is the maximal distance between any pair of vertices. And it's easy to check that this component has diameter two. Okay, now some more motivation in the context of some more graphs. In particular, I'll be speaking about a certain hierarchy of graphs defined on the same vertex set, the non-identity elements of G. And this hierarchy was recently introduced by Peter Cameron. So we start with the complete graph on the set of vertices. And a subgraph of this graph is the non-generating graph. This is just the complement of the generating graph. And here in the case of D12, A cubed is now joined to all other vertices, but I haven't drawn in all those edges. Now, when G is non-abelian, a subgraph of this graph is the commuting graph, where two vertices are joined by an edge. That's what this tilde symbol means, if and only if the elements commute. And there are additional graphs in this hierarchy, but I will not define them here. Now, given a binary relation on the elements of a group, or indeed on the subgroups of a group, as we'll see later, it's useful and interesting to construct the graph encoding this relation. This often gives us new ways of understanding the underlying groups and even differentiating between individual groups or families of groups. And sometimes if we're fortunate enough, the graphs themselves can provide applications in various areas of group theory. So these graphs, I guess, except for the complete graph, are very interesting to study. But it's also interesting to study the difference between subsequent graphs in the hierarchy. In particular, the very well-studied generating graph is the difference between the complete graph and non-generating graph. And in this talk, I'll be considering the next difference that is between the non-generating graph and the commuting graph. So let's define that graph. Well, this graph is called the non-commuting non-generating graph of G, and we denote it by gamma of G. This graph actually has vertices, the non-central elements of G, with two vertices joined by an edge, if and only if they do not commute and they, no, and they do not generate G. In other words, they generate a proper subgroup of G. Now we exclude central vertices from the definition because of course, these are the vertices that commute with all other elements or rather these are the elements that commute with all other elements. And so they would always be isolated vertices. And so we just delete them for convenience. But as we'll soon see, there can still be some additional isolated vertices. So let's again, look at the example in the case, in the case of D12. And we'll look at a way of constructing this graph starting with the generating graph. So we first want to take the complement of this graph to obtain the non-generating graph. 
and recall that gamma of g is the difference between this graph and the commuting graph. So we'll delete all these dashed edges corresponding to pairs of vertices that commute. Okay. And finally, we want to delete all vertices corresponding to central elements of G. So we delete A cubed. Okay, and this gives us the non-commuting, non-generating graph of D12. And you'll notice that there are two isolated vertices and a connected component of diameter two. And indeed, connectedness and diameter are the properties of the graph that I'll be looking at in this talk. So first, the motivation in the context of the generating graph. And throughout the talk, I'll be discussing the generating graph a few times. And to make it clear that I'm doing so, I'll be using these strawberry colored blocks. Okay, so one of the most well-known results in the area of graphs defined on groups is this result from 2008, proved by Breuer, Grant, Cantor. And this result states that the generating graph of any non-abelian finite simple group is connected with lambda two. Now note that any such group can indeed be generated by two elements, as otherwise the generating graph would have no edges. And this result was actually generalized further just last year by Tim Burness, Bob Garanik, and Scott Harper. They proved that the generating graph, well, if the generating graph of any finite group has no isolated vertices, then it, will, then it is always connected with diameter at most two. So these are very nice results, and they lead us to ask some of the questions about gamma of G. In particular, when is the graph connected? And more generally, what are the diameters of the graph's connected components? Now, before- I have a, I have a quick question about uh, these ones. Uh, yes. Are either of these like, are these basically uh, resorting to classification or is there some? Yeah, they, other these, do use work the, these definitely do heavily use the classification of finite simple groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, this result also um, uses, uh, I, I guess, a pretty complicated um, result, or at least a complicated proof uh, that allows them to just consider the almost simple groups. Um, basically a reduction to almost simple groups. Um, so before uh, addressing these questions in much detail, there are two easy observations we can make. First of all, the vertices of gamma of G are precisely the non-central elements of the group. And so the graph will be empty. In other words, it will have no vertices, even only if G is abelian. We can also prove that no connected component of the group, of the graph rather, has a diameter one. And to prove this, I'll make some room on the slide by hiding these blocks. So let's suppose for a contradiction that there is a component of diameter one. So this means that, uh, well, such a component must contain at least two vertices, say X and Y. And because the component has diameter one, they must be joined by an edge. Now, whenever Y is joined to X in the graph, it's easy to show that Y is joined to X inverse. So let's suppose for now that X and X inverse are distinct elements. Now, X and X inverse, of course, do not commute. So they can't be joined by an edge in the non-commuting, non-generating graph which means they can't both be vertices in this component of diameter one. So this distinct vertex X inverse and this distinct edge do not exist, which means that X of course is equal to X inverse. And so X is order two, recalling that the identity cannot be a vertex in this graph. So this actually means that all vertices in this component have order two. Now, whenever X and Y are joined, it's easy to show that they're each joined to X times Y. So these three vertices all have order two and it follows easily that actually X and Y commute which means that this original edge, which we assume to exist, does not, which of course is a contradiction. And so indeed, no such component can exist. Now, as I said, there are graph will have no vertices if and only if G is abelian. What about the case where there are vertices, but no edges? In other words, where all the vertices are isolated. So let's suppose that G is non-abelian so that there are vertices. Now an edge in the graph is exactly a pair of non-generating elements that do not commute. This means that the graph will have no edges if and only if every pair of non-generating elements do commute. Now a pair of non-generating elements is precisely a pair of elements that lie in a common proper subgroup. And so it follows that this is equivalent to the property that every proper subgroup of G is abelian. And a non-abelian group with this property is called minimal non-abelian. Okay, now the finite minimal non-abelian groups were classified in 1903 by Miller and Moreno. In particular, any such group has order divisible by at most two primes. On the other hand, in the infinite case, not every minimal non-abelian group is known. But some modern examples are the Tarski monsters. These are infinite simple groups where the order of every proper non-trivial subgroup is some fixed prime p. And in fact, in 1982, Oshansky showed that a Tarski monster does exist whenever p is greater than 10 to the power of 75. Now, this value is probably way larger than necessary, but at least Oshansky showed that this value suffices. <laughs> 
Okay, now let's briefly consider the significance of the, the minimum size D of a generating set for G. Now it's quite easy to see that the case D equals two is the only interesting case when you consider the generating graph. That's because when D is one, the, gr the group is cyclic, and therefore we know exactly what the generating graph looks like. It's just not interesting. And if D is greater than two, then as I mentioned earlier, there are no generating pairs, and so the generating graph will have no edges. In fact, for our purposes, the D equals two case is also the only interesting case. So why is that? Well, when D is one, again, the group is cyclic and therefore abelian, and therefore the graph has no vertices. And if D is at least three, then again, the group has no generating pairs. And so gamma of G is precisely the non-commuting graph of G, which again has vertices, the non-central elements of G. And here, of course, two vertices are joined by an edge, if and only if they do not commute. So why is this case not interesting? Well, in 2006, Abdullahi, Akbari, and Maimani proved that for a non-abelian group G, the non-commuting graph of G always has diameter two. And for example, here's the non-commuting graph of D12. We can easily check that this is diameter two. And why is this proposition true in general? Let's prove it. So let's let X and Y be vertices in the graph. In other words, non-central elements of G. So this means that the centralized of X and G and the centralized of Y and G are proper subgroups of G. Now it's an easy exercise to show that the union of two proper subgroups of a group is a proper subset. And this means there's some element H and G, depending on X and Y, that centralizes neither X nor Y. And so X, H, Y is a path in the graph. So we've shown that given any pair of vertices in the graph, it's a path of length at most two joining them. So the diameter of the graph is at most two. And in fact, the kind of diameter one for the same reason as gamma of G. And so we've proved this result. Okay, so this is why we're only interested in gamma of G when G is two generated and non-abelian. If it's abelian, there are no vertices. And if it's non-abelian and not two generated, then we know that the diameter is always two. Now, if we're investigating properties of gamma of G other than diameter, then the case when G is not two generated is probably very interesting. But for our purposes, we only want to look at the case where G is two generated. Okay, now an observation related to this previous slide. We'll let H be a maximal subgroup of G and X and Y non-central elements of H. Now here's a definition. The subgraph of gamma of G induced by the non-central elements of H is a subgraph with this vertex set and with all pre-existing edges between these vertices. In other words, two vertices in this induced subgraph are joined by an edge, if and only if they're joined by an edge in the original graph gamma of G. Okay, now these vertices X and Y lie in H. So of course they generate a subgroup of H, which is proper in G. And so X and Y do not generate G. Therefore X and Y are joined in gamma of G if and only if they do not commute. So this means that the subgraph of gamma of G induced by the non-central elements of H is precisely the non-commuting graph of H, which we know has diameter two. So if we, so given a group G, if we know in enough detail the maximal subgroup structure of G, then using this observation and similar results, we can often obtain either an exact value or an upper bound for the diameter of gamma of G. So this result is often very useful. Okay. Um, for now, though, I previously looked at the case where every vertex in the graph was isolated, in other words, where there are no edges. Now let's look at isolated vertices more generally. So we'll again assume that G is non-abelian and two generated. Now again, an edge in the graph is exactly a pair of non-generating elements that do not commute. So a vertex will be isolated if and only if, whenever it does not generate G with some other element, those two elements commute. And it follows that a vertex is isolated if and only if every maximal subgroup containing that element in fact, centralizes it. Now, it's easy to show that a non-central element of G is centralized by at most one maximal subgroup. And it follows that X is isolated if and only if it lies in a unique maximal subgroup M, and it is in fact center in M. Now to unpack this a bit further, it's clear from above that if one and two both hold, then X is indeed isolated. If instead one does not hold, then X lies in at least two maximal subgroups, it's non, sorry, it's, it lies in at least two, it's central one at most one, and so it's non-central in at least one, and therefore X is not isolated. And if one holds but two does not, then X is a non-central element of M, and so again, it is not isolated. Okay, now a question that I have here is, if X is isolated, can M be non-abelian? So this is just asking, if X lies in a unique maximal subgroup, and it's central in that subgroup, can M be non-abelian? So this is a very easy question to state, and you might think it's very easy to answer, but it, I don't actually know the answer to this question. However, in the case where M is normal, it's easy to show that M must actually be abelian. And I won't prove this here, 
but it follows easily from one and two and from the fact that if the quotient of m by its center is cyclic, then m must be abelian. Okay, I will revisit this question in more generality later on in the talk. For now, I'd like to look at the structure of gamma of g when g lies in certain families of groups. And to begin with, I'll define the family of nonpotent and soluble groups. Now, many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with these definitions. And for those of you who aren't, the definitions to start with here are a bit technical, so you certainly don't need to memorize them. Okay, so we'll let H and K be subgroups of G. The commutator of H and K, denoted by this bracket notation, is the subgroup of G generated by these commutators of elements from H and K, where such a commutator is defined like this. Okay, now we define two sequences of subgroups of G, gamma I of G and alpha I of G, indexed by positive integers I. So we define gamma one of G to be G itself. And for each I, gamma I plus one of G is the commutator of gamma I of G and G. Now, similarly, alpha one of G is G itself, but alpha I plus one of G is the commutator of alpha I of G with itself instead of with G. Okay, we say that G is more potent if gamma I of G is trivial for some I and soluble if alpha I of G is trivial for some I. Now, this first sequence of subgroups is called the lower central series of G. And this, standard, this notation is standard. The second sequence is called the derived series of G. And this notation is not exactly standard, but I've just used it to match the notation for the first sequence. Now, every nonpotent group is soluble, but there are non-nonpotent soluble groups, for example, the symmetric group of degree four. Um, and so, especially when G is finite, there are many equivalent definitions for nonpotency and also some for solubility. And in particular, an important one is that a finite group is nonpotent if and only if it is the direct product of its helial subgroups. And for example, uh, for finite groups, a group is soluble if and only if all of its composition factors are cyclic, if you know what those are. But that won't be important for this talk. Okay, now another fact is that if any group is nonpotent, then every maximal subgroup of that group is normal. And in fact, the converse is true for finite groups. That is, if G is a finite group with every maximal subgroup normal, then G is nonpotent. However, there are infinite non-nonpotent groups that still have every maximal subgroup normal. Okay, and now we're looking at the case where G is a group with every maximal subgroup normal. So this includes all nonpotent groups and some additional infinite groups. Okay, and for convenience, we'll define delta of G to be the graph obtained from gamma of G by deleting all isolated vertices. So for example, here's D12 again, not a nonpotent group, but a nice small example we've seen already. On the left, we have gamma of D12, if we delete the isolated vertices, we obtain delta of D12. Okay, now here's a theorem I proved with my supervisors, Cole Radio Duke and Peter Cameron. If G is a group with every maximal subgroup normal, then delta of G could be empty, again, which means it has no vertices, or it could be connected with diameter two or three. And in fact, if it has diameter three, then delta of G is equal to gamma of G, meaning that gamma of G itself has no isolated vertices and is connected with diameter three. Now there are indeed examples where gamma of G has diameter three, examples where gamma of G itself has diameter two, and examples where gamma of G has a component of diameter two plus isolated vertices. Now I won't prove this theorem in detail, but I will say that it uses the observation from before about the subgraph um, of gamma of G induced by the non-central element of a maximal subgroup and similar observations. And we also use the fact that a non-abelian normal maximal subgroup cannot contain any isolated vertices. Okay, now if G is finite and therefore nonpotent, we can actually prove a much more precise relationship um, between the structures of the group G and gamma of G. I won't give that relationship here, it's a bit too technical, and I also won't describe the proof, but I will say that uh, to prove this, we basically start by looking at the structure of the non commuting non generating graph of a finite P group, and then use the fact that a finite nonpotent group is the direct product of its heal subgroups. So, what I will talk about, because it's interesting in general, is what gamma of G looks like when G is the direct product of groups. So here is another result proved with my supervisors. We'll let A and B be arbitrary groups with A non-abelian. So first of all, if B is not cyclic, then the graph of the direct product of A and B is connected with diameter two. And if instead B is cyclic and the graph of A is connected with diameter K, then the graph of the direct product is connected with diameter at most K. Now, again, I won't prove this, but I will state that the main observation used in the proof is that if A1 and A2 are elements of A that do not generate A, then any pair of corresponding elements of the direct product will not generate the direct product. And separately, 
if A1 and A2 do not commute, then the element of the right product will not commute. And of course, this also holds if we swap the elements of A and B. So it's very easy for two vertices in the graph of the direct product to be joined directly by an edge. And that's why, especially in case one, the graph has uh, the smallest diameter possible. Okay, now an example related to case two of the lemma. Again, this uh, group, as I've said, is not important, but it's a nice small example. So the graph of the symmetric group of degree four is connected with diameter three. If we take the direct product of S4 with the cyclic group of order two, then we obtain a graph with diameter two. And if instead we take the direct product of S4 with C3, then the graph has diameter three. So this at most k from the lemma is important. Here, this direct product could have diameter k, or it could have diameter strictly less than k, depending on a and b. OK, now you'll notice that if a and b are non abelian finite simple groups, or in fact, if one or both of them are direct products of such groups, then the graph of this direct product, again, is always connected with diameter 2. That is very different from what happens with the generating graph. In particular, in 2013, Crestani and Lucchini proved that for any positive integer k, there exists an odd prime p and a positive integer n, such that if we exclude isolated vertices, the generating graph of the direct product of n copies of the simple group PSL to two to the p is connected with diameter greater than k. So unlike the non-commuting non-generating graph where the diameter is always two, for the generating graph, excluding isolated vertices, this diameter has no upper bound, which I think is a very interesting difference between these two graphs. Okay, so now, so you go on. For this theorem, do you know if n is explicit or? Um, I think n is the, um, uh, so I, I think they choose probably the largest direct product such that this is still two generated. But uh, their theorem is certainly more detailed than what I've said here. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so now let's move on to soluble groups, which as I've said, uh, includes all important groups, but is more general. And here I'll mostly be focusing on finite groups. So in 2017, Andrea Lucchini proved that for any two generated finite soluble group G, if we exclude isolated vertices, then the generating graph of G is connected with diameter at most three. Now you'll notice that this is basically exactly what we proved for no potent groups if we replace generating graph with gamma of G and of course soluble with more potent. So does this still hold for gamma of G if we consider soluble groups? Well, in fact, it does not. Why is that? <clears throat> Well, there are two generated finite soluble groups G, as depicted in this diagram here, with maximal subgroups M1, M2, up to Mn, where any two distinct maximal subgroups have an intersection equal to the center of M1, which properly contains the center of G, and any maximal subgroup other than M1 has a center equal to the center of G. Now, gamma of G in this case actually has two distinct components, each of diameter two, one consisting of the vertices in M1 outside its center, and the other consisting of all other vertices. Now, why is this the case? Well, starting from a vertex in M1 outside its center, we of course cannot join it by an edge to a vertex in the center of M1 because they commute. And we can't join one of these upper vertices to a vertex uh, outside of M1 because each of these vertices lies in unique distinct maximal subgroups. And so of course these two elements generate the group. So this upper component is indeed separate from the lower one. As for the diameters, this upper component um, has diameter two, because as we, well, it's clear that this is precisely the subgraph of gamma of G induced by the non-central element of M1, which we know has diameter two. That's just the non-commuting graph of M1. As for the lower component, as I said before, any non-central element of a G is centralized by at most one maximal suburb. And in fact, the full centralizer in G of any of these vertices in the center of M1 is equal to M1 itself. So we can join a vertex in the center of M1 directly to any vertex outside of M1. And so it's easy to see that this lower component as diameter two. Okay, so we'll call a group G a two-two group if like in this case, the graph consists of two components, each of diameter two. So for a finite soluble group, G could indeed be a two-two group, but otherwise we only get the possibilities that we saw for potent groups. That is delta of G could be empty or connected with diameter two or three. And if it has diameter three, then so does gamma of G. Now, if G is an infinite soluble group, the only other possibility is that gamma of G has diameter four. Now, if this is the case, then the group G has to satisfy very specific properties. And I don't know if such a group G does exist, but if a group of those properties does exist, then gamma of G will have diameter four. Okay, now let's look uh, in more detail at the finite two-two groups. And in fact, we'll be able to classify them 
Um, and first we'll require this theorem from Atan uh, from 1980. So this theorem states that a finite group G has exactly two conjugacy classes of maximal subgroups, if and only if there exists distinct primes P and R, such that two things hold. First of all, G is the semi-direct product of a seal of P subgroup P and a cyclic seal of R subgroup R. For those of you who don't know what this means, the semi-direct product is a certain generalization of a direct product of groups. This means that P and R are subgroups of G with P normal, P and R intersecting trivially, and G being equal to the product of P and R. And if R were also normal, then this would be a direct product, but in this case, R is not. And we also require that R acts irreducibly on the quotient of P by its Fratini subgroup. This Fratini subgroup of P denoted by phi of P is the intersection of all of P's maximal subgroups. And this quotient is essentially a vector space defined over the field of P elements. Okay, so now we can state that a finite group G is a 2-2 group, if and only if G is as in the theorem above, where the Fratini subgroup is equal to the center of P which is not contained in the center of G. Okay, now I'd like to give an example of an infinite family of 2-2 groups. So first of all, the simple Suzuki groups uh, are an infinite family of finite simple groups, in particular exceptional groups of Lie type, defined by a parameter Q, which is two to the power of an odd integer i at least three. And sometimes this is called the uh, twisted V2 of Q, but I'll just call it Suzuki Q. So let's consider this simple group. Okay, so a seal of two subgroup of this group has a normalizer n equal to the semi-direct product of a group H of order Q squared and a cyclic group of order Q minus one. We can in fact show that there exists a prime divisor R of Q minus one, such that the subgroup of N equal to the semi-direct product of H and the cyclic group of order R is a two, two group. And you can see easily that different Suzuki groups will give different two, two groups because they have different values of Q. And so uh, this indeed gives an infinite family of two, two groups. I also say that the smallest two two group is order ninety six, and unlike all of these examples, there exist odd order two two groups. Okay, so now let's move on to insoluble groups, in other words, groups that are not soluble. And here I will really only be speaking about finite groups. Okay, so I'd like to uh, cover three cases. First of all, if the quotient of G by its center has a proper non-cyclic quotient, then gamma of G is connected with diameter two or three. Second, if G is trivial center and is not simple, then delta of G at least is connected with lambda two or three. And finally, if G is simple, then gamma of G is connected with lambda at most five. Now, where does this value of five come from? Well, let's let M1 and M2 be maximal subgroups of the simple group G, and we'll assume that they have even order. We'll also let X and Y be non-central elements of M1 and M2 respectively. So in particular, X and Y are non-isolated vertices of gamma of G. Now, because G is simple and M1 and M2 have even order, I won't explain how, but we can show that there exist elements A and B of order two and M1 and M2 respectively that do not lie in the centers of their corresponding maximal subgroups and such that A and B do not commute. Now, because A and B are involutions, they generate a dihedral subgroup. In fact, the dihedral subgroup of order two times the order of AB. And because they don't commute and they generate this dihedral subgroup, which of course is proper in the simple group G, A and B are joined by an edge. Additionally, X and A are non-central elements of M1, so we know that they're joined by a path of length M2. Again, consider the subgraph of gamma of G induced by the non-central element of M1. Similarly, the distance between B and Y is at most two. So here we have a path of length M5 between X and Y. So basically what we've shown is that as long as all maximal subgroups of G have even order, and as long as all vertices in the graph are not isolated, then we've proved this result. But of course, this uh, well, there are of course simple groups that contain maximal subgroups of odd order, so we have to consider these. And I'll speak more about these groups later on in the talk. We also have to show that the graph has no isolated vertices, and I'll say more about that shortly. For now, you may have noticed that not all finite insoluble groups have been accounted for in this theorem. In particular, uh, we could have a group that is a central extension of a group in case two or three. In other words, we could have a group H such that the group G in case two or three is equal to the quotient of H by its center or isomorphic to, I suppose. Now in general, if we have a central extension of a group uh, G and if G is trivial center with gamma of G connected with diameter K, then gamma of H is connected with diameter at most K. So for example, if G is simple, then any central extension of G has a graph that is connected with diameter at most five. Now we can't apply this to all of the groups in case two 
because here we only know that delta of g is connected and not gamma of g. So this brings us to the question, for a group G in case two, is it possible for delta of G and gamma of G to be distinct? Now, first I'll note that if there is such a group G satisfying this property, then we can show that for a group H, a central extension of G, delta of H is actually connected with lambda at most four. But in general, so this question about whether delta of G can, you, can be distinct from gamma of G is of course asking if gamma of G can have isolated vertices. So let's return to looking at isolated vertices. Recall that a vertex X is isolated if and only if X lies in a unique maximal subgroup M and X is central in M. And the question from before was, if X is isolated, can M be non-abelian? So again, I don't know the answer to this question, but it's important to note that no finite insoluble group contains an abelian maximal subgroup. And so if the answer to this question is no, at least in the finite case, then every finite insoluble group has delta of G equal to gamma of G, which in general must therefore be connected with diameter at most five, or in fact, at most three, if G is a central extension of the group in case two of the previous result. Now, as for simple groups, so Bob Garanik and Gareth Tracy have a paper in preparation classifying the elements of finite groups that lie in a unique maximal subgroup. Using their results, we can show that if G is finite and simple and X satisfies one, in other words, X lies in a unique maximal subgroup, M, then X is not central in M. And so X is not isolated. And so as we claimed before, in this case, delta of G is equal to gamma of G and is connected with diameter at most five. Okay, so now I'd like to say a bit more about the non-commuting non-generated graph of a finite simple group. And so I thought I should briefly summarize the classification of finite simple groups. So here, N would note an integer at least two, P a prime and Q a prime power. So I'm going to give a list of groups not every group in this list will be simple, but at least every simple group does appear in this list. Okay, so to start with, the only abelian examples are of course the cyclic groups of prime order P. The non-abelian examples are first of all, the alternating groups of degree at least five, the classical groups, namely the linear groups, the unitary groups, the symplectic groups, and the orthogonal groups, where this value epsilon can take uh, one of three values and this denotes the type of the orthogonal group, but I won't define what that means here. We could also have an exceptional group of Lie type belonging to one of these families, including the family of Suzuki groups that we saw before. And finally, 26 parameter groups that do not fall into any of these infinite families. So as I mentioned, for certain values of N and Q, some of these groups are not simple or even not defined, but at least all simple groups do appear in this list. Okay, now some fun facts. The largest parameter group is called the monster group, and its order is given here. And of course, because the largest group is called the monster group, this means that the second largest sporadic group is of course called the baby monster group, which I think is cute. And will be this group will be important very shortly. Okay, so let's see. So here this, this table gives either exact values or upper bounds for the diameter of gamma of G when G is a non-abelian finite simple group. So the first two rows here consist of the smallest sporadic groups. And these are some of the Mathieu and Yanko groups. The values of the diameter here were determined computationally using magma. In the third row, we have the baby monster group and the unitary group PSU72. So using some results about the intersection graph, which I'll talk about shortly, we can prove that the diameter in this case has a lo lower bound of four. And by looking at the elements and maximal subgroups of these groups, we can show that four, we can show that four is in fact an upper bound. So the diameter here is equal to four. In these remaining cases, using various techniques, we can obtain these upper bounds. And this value of five here is just the value from the previous theorem that we saw in case three. Okay, so a question here is, can any of these upper bounds be reduced? So it's possible that some or all of these upper bounds are not tight. In particular, I don't know if there is a finite non-abelian simple group where gamma of G has diameter five, but at least we know that there are some with diameter four. Okay, now the final slide about gamma of G, I'd like to uh, give some more examples of infinite groups. So our first example is Thompson's group F. This is a two generated group given by this presentation shown here. And it is in fact an infinite group whose commutator subgroup, that is the commutator of F of itself, is an infinite simple group. Now this commutator subgroup is the unique minimal, minimal normal subgroup of F. And the quotient of F by the subgroup is isomorphic to the direct product of Z with itself. Now I won't explain exactly how, but using these facts, we can show that the graph of F is connected with the ambit two. Now, our next example is the infinite dihedral group generated, generated by two elements A and B, each of order two 
with no relation between them. Now we can show that the graph of this group consists of two isolated vertices, AB and BA, plus a connected component of diameter two. Next, we have the free group on two generators, generated by, again, two elements A and B, with no relation between them. And we can think of A and B here as having infinite order. Okay, we can show that in this case that the graph has diameter two. More generally, if G is generated by two elements A and B, with no relation between them, with A and B having order R and S respectively, which are at least two and possibly infinite, then either G is the infinite dihedral group or gamma of G is connected with diameter two. Now, if you uh, know what such things are, you may realize that in this case, G is the free product of the cyclic group of order R and the cyclic group of order S. More generally, if we take the direct product, or the free product rather, of two non sorry, if we take the free product of two non-trivial groups, and at least one of them is not cyclic, then this group G will not be two generated, which means, of course, that the graph is diameter two. So the only case where G is a free product of two non-trivial groups and the graph is not connected with diameter two is in fact the infinite dihedral group, which I think is an interesting fact. Okay, so now uh, before I move on to talking about the intersection graph, are there any questions so far? Okay, let's move on then. So now I'll be talking about the intersection graph of a finite group. This graph, which would note by sigma g, was defined in 1969 by Chukani and Pollock. So this intersection graph has vertices the proper non-trivial subgroups of g, the two vertices joined by an edge, if and only if they intersect non-trivially. Now this graph was actually introduced as an analog to the intersection graph of a semigroup, which was defined by Bosak a few years earlier. And I'll say more about this later, but this intersection graph has a certain uh, connection a duality connection with the non-generating graph. And because the non-generating graph and gamma of G are so closely connected, there's also a strong connection between this graph and the non-commuting non-generating graph. But more on that later. For now, let's look at two examples of the intersection graph. First, the case where G is the alternating group of degree four. Here, I've labeled the subgroups by their orders. And we see that there are some isolated vertices plus a component of diameter two. For our second example, we look at the intersection graph of the dihedral group of order eight. Here I've labeled the subgroups by the orders and conjugacy classes. Now, uh, we can see that this graph has diameter three. For an example of a pair of vertices whose distance is three, take one labeled 2a and one labeled 2c. We can go from 2a to 4a to 4b to 2c, giving a path of length three. And there's no shorter path than that between those vertices. Okay. Now, Chukani and Pollock proved a nice result about these graphs in the case which is non-trivial, finite, and non-simple. So first of all, the graph is disconnected, in other words, not connected, if and only if G is the direct product of two cyclic groups of prime order, P and Q here could be the same or distinct, or G is trivial center and is minimal non-abelian, which you'll recall means that G is non-abelian with every proper subgroup abelian. And this uh, latter case is what occurs for A4. On the other hand, if the graph is connected, then its diameter is always at most four. Now, as, we, as we've seen here, the graph of D8 has diameter three, but it's not actually known if there is a finite non-simple group G where the diameter is equal to four. If a group G does exist with this diameter, then G is actually the semi direct product of a non-abelian simple group and a cyclic group, cyclic group of odd prime order P. This was essentially observed by Chikani and Pollock in their original paper. They didn't say that the prime P has to be odd, but this is quite easy to deduce. Okay, so Chikani and Pollock looked at the case where G is finite and non-simple. So now let's look at the case where G is finite and simple, and of course, non-abelian. Okay, so first of all, in 2010, Shen proved that sigma G is always connected in this case. In the same year, Herzog, Longavardi, and Mai independently investigated the subgraph of sigma G induced by the maximum subgroups of G. In other words, here the vertices are the maximal subgroups of G, again with two vertices joined by an edge, if and only if they intersect non-trivially. They proved that that induced subgraph was connected. And because, of course, any proper non trivial, non maximal subgroup is joined directly in the graph to any maximal subgroup containing it, it follows from their work that sigma g is connected. So these two papers proved the same thing essentially independently in the same year. Now, what about the diameter of this graph? So I'll state this a bit out of order chronologically, 
but I'd like to give a lower bound first. So in 2017, Shasavari and Kasravi proved that three is a lower bound for the diameter of sigma g. And indeed, this lower bound is tight. As for the upper bound, the work of Herzog et al. Uh, implies that it implies an upper bound of 64 for this diameter. And this was reduced to 28 by Ma in 2016. Now, just last year, I was able to prove that for a non abelian finite simple group G, the diameter of the intersection graph of G is always at most five. And in fact, this value of five is achieved for the baby monster group. And only, so the only groups for which it's achieved are the baby monster group and certain unitary groups, PSU and Q, with N and N prime. Currently, the only known example of such a group is PSU72. Um, but it's likely that there are additional examples. And so classifying all the unitary examples where the diameter is five would be quite interesting. Okay, so how do we prove this theorem? Well, first of all, let's let S1 and S2 be proper, non-trivial, non-maximal subgroups of G. And let's let M1 and M2 be maximal subgroups containing S1 and S2, respectively. And for now, we'll assume that M1 and M2 have even order. Now, the intersection of S1 and M1, of course, is equal to S1, which is non-trivial. And so S1 and M1 are joined in the graph. And similarly for S2 and M2. Now, as we saw when we, when we were looking at the non-commuting, non-generating graph of a simple group, these even order maximal subgroups M1 and M2 each intersect non-trivially with a common dihedral subgroup D, which of course is proper in G. And so here we have this path of length four between S1 and S2. So what we've shown here is that if all maximal subgroups of G have even order, then the diameter of the graph is always at most four. So again, we only have to look at the finite non-abelian simple groups that have maximal subgroups of, of odd order. So let's do that. Now, the classification of these groups was essentially completed in 1991 by Liebeck and Saxel, and I'll explain what I mean by this shortly. So first of all, the first uh, family of groups with maximal subgroups of odd order is the family of alternating groups of prime degree n. Now for this family and for some further families, uh, there are, there are certain primes n uh, for which the maximal subgroups are even order. But uh, so again, there will be some groups here um, for which there are no maximal subgroups of all order, but at least all the finite non-abelian simple groups with maximal subgroups of all order do appear in this list. Okay, so first of all, for these alternating groups, Chukani and Pollock proved that their diameter, the, the diameter of the graph is always at most four. And in fact, in 2010, Shen gave an alternative proof of this fact. He proved that for any maximal subgroup M of G, the order of M times the order of the maximal subgroup A n minus one is greater than the order of G. This means that in the product of M and A n minus one, there's some non-identity element that can be expressed in at least two ways as a product of an element from M and an element from A n minus one. And this means that M and A n minus one intersect non-trivially. Now, again, any proper non-trivial non-maximal subgroup will be adjacent to some maximal subgroup in the graph and so it follows easily that the diameter of the graph is at most four. Okay, now next example is the sporadic Mathieu group M23. If we argue as shended in the alternating case, we can prove that the diameter here is actually equal to four. Okay, next is the sporadic Thompson group. Here it turns out that actually every prime order subgroup lies in the maximal subgroup of even order. Now any subgroup containing a prime order subgroup has all the neighbors of that prime order subgroup. And so it follows that every a vertex in the graph is either equal to or adjacent to a maximal subgroup of even order. And it again follows that the diameter here is at most four. Okay, now we'll see on the next slide that the baby monster has a graph with diameter five. And so, as I mentioned, Liebig and Saxel essentially completed the classification of these groups, but back in 1991, when they published their paper, not enough was known about the maximal subgroups of the monster group. But now, thanks to more recent work of Holmes and Wilson, we know that this group has no maximum subgroup of odd order. And so again, the diameter is at most four. Now there are two more families of groups. First, the linear groups PSL and Q with N prime. So we can prove that the diameter here is at most four using some very nice arguments suggested by Peter Cameron, which involve the action of the group on the set of one dimensional subspaces of the n-dimensional vector space defined over the field of Q elements. And finally, PSU and Q with N and odd prime, the unitary groups. Here, the diameter is at most five, and we can prove this using some arguments that are somewhat similar to those of the linear case. Okay, so now let's consider the case where G is the baby monster group. We'll prove that the diameter of sigma, so sigma G is equal to five. So again, we'll let S1 and S2 be proper non-trivial, non-maximal subgroups of G. 
and we'll consider the distance in the graph between S1 and S2. We'll also let M1 and M2 be maximal subgroups containing S1 and S2 respectively. So what we want to show is that the distance between S1 and S2 is always at most five, and that there is some S1 and S2 for which the distance is at least five. Now again, any neighbor of S1 will be a neighbor of M1, and similarly for S2 and M2. So it is okay to assume that S1 and S2 are not maximal because the distance between S1 and anything else will be um, greater than or equal to the distance between M1 and that other vertex, for example. Okay, and recall that if M1 and M2 are both have even order, then the distance between S1 and S2 is at most four. So we can assume that S1, for example, lies in no maximal subgroup of even order. Then it turns out that S1 is cyclic of order 47, and M1 is the semi-direct product of S1 and a cyclic group H of order 23. Now we can show that there's some maximal subgroup L of G that contains H with L having even order and the square of the order of L being greater than the order of G. Now, because H lies in both M1 and L, M1 and L intersect non-trivially, and because the square of the order of L is greater than the order of G, as in Shen's argument in the automating case, this means that L and L to the X intersect non-trivially for any X and G. Okay, now if M2 is even order, then because L also is even order, there's again a dihedral subgroup joined to both L and M2. And so we have this path of length five between S1 and S2. If instead M2 is odd order, then M2 is M1 to the X for some X and G. And because L and L to the X intersect non-trivially, we again have a path of length five. So the distance between S1 and S2 is always at most five. And so indeed the diameter is at most five. So now it remains to show that there are subgroups S1 and S2 for which the distance is at least five. So letting S1, M1, and H be as they are here, there's a certain counting argument. I won't go into the details here, but this involves the maximal subgroups of G that contain G conjugates of H. And this argument shows that there's some element X and G such that the distance between M1 and M1 to the X is at least three. Now M1 is a unique neighbor of S1 in the graph. And so M1 to the X is a unique neighbor of S1 to the X. And it follows that S1 and S1 to the X have distance at least five. So we've shown that the diameter is at least five and it's at most five. So it is indeed exactly equal to five. Right now to conclude, I'd like to talk a bit about the relationships between sigma G and some other graphs. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a certain nice duality relationship between sigma G and the non-generating graph, which just for now I'll denote by omega of G. So these two graphs actually form something called a dual pair as defined by Peter Cameron. So in general, this has a more general, relation, a more general definition, but in this context, what this means is that any two adjacent subgroups in sigma G contain a common element, a common non-identity element, in other words, a common element in the vertex set of the non-generating graph, and any two adjacent elements in the non-generating graph lie in a common proper non-trivial subgroup of G, in other words, a common vertex of sigma G. So there's this nice duality relationship between these two graphs. Now, Peter Cameron proved that any two connected graphs that form a dual pair have diameters that are either equal or differ by one. So using this fact, and the fact, oh, actually, first of all, let me define one more graph. So the soluble graph of the baby monster, for example, has vertex set to non-identity elements with two vertices joined by an edge, if and only if they generate a soluble subgroup. Okay, so, so using this result about dual pairs from Peter Cameron and the fact that sigma b and sigma PSU72 have diameter five, we can prove a few things. First of all, because sigma g and non-generating graph form dual pairs, we can prove that the non-generating graphs of B and PSU72 each have diameter four. In particular, this result here means that four is a lower bound for the diameters of these graphs. And in fact, by looking at the um, structures of the, well, looking at the maximal subgroups and elements, we can prove that this is exactly equal to four. And indeed, that's what I mentioned we do for gamma of B and gamma of PSU72 earlier. So using similar methods, we can prove that these non-commuting non-generating graphs also have diameter four. Now, very recently, Tim Berners, Andrea Lucchini, and Daniel Nemi proved that the soluble graph of B has diameter either four or five. So we don't know exactly what its diameter is, but this lower bound of four comes from the fact that sigma B has diameter five, and this soluble graph is actually, actually forms a dual pair with the subgraph of sigma B induced by the soluble subgroups of B. So this gives, so well, this highlights some very nice connections between sigma B and sigma PSU72, which are defined on the subgroups of the corresponding groups, and these graphs, which are defined on the, on the elements of the corresponding groups.
So I think that's a good place to stop. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, so for the talk, and let's congratulate him. Um, just know, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Anyone has any question? I don't really have much intelligent to say about the graph theory, the group theory sort of stuff going on here, but um, I am interested, do you know if there's any other graph characteristics other than diameter that have shown any use in kind of this sort of area? Uh, certainly, I mean, there are many. Um, uh, so Peter Cameron, uh, if you Google uh, Peter Cameron graphs defined on groups, he has a whole survey paper talking about these graphs defined on groups. Um, other parameters are, are for example, the, um, uh, sorry, I'm blanking a bit, but uh, the, uh, like a number involving colorings of the graphs and uh, maximal cliques and co-cliques and so on. Uh, there are very important uh, parameters. One thing, I guess, not exactly uh, corresponding to a parameter as such, but um, let me go back to, here, to, to the commuting graph. Uh, and a very nice application of this graph, if we add a loop to each vertex, then uh, the random, a random walk on this commuting graph is actually uniform on conjugacy classes, which means that if we perform a random walk uh, over many, many steps, then this is a good way of randomly obtaining elements of a group that lie in very small conjugacy classes. Uh, and I don't exactly know how, but the commuting graph was um, very a vital uh, component of the classification of finite simple groups. Um, but yeah, there are many uh, different parameters and properties of graphs that can be studied other than diameter. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have one question as well. More on the side, like, uh, here usually yeah, you, you are getting a group and building the graphs, but I wanted to know if given some type of, some finite graph, can you find some properties to say that there can be a group that has a, that graph has one of these graphs or is it like a hard question to do? Like the reverse side of things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that is definitely a question that um, many people, including Peter Cameron, uh, have been looking at. Uh, and again, in Peter Cameron's survey paper, I think that is mentioned. Uh, I don't know much about that myself, but for example, very interesting questions are, um, so given uh, a graph that we know is the, for example, commuting graph for some group, um, which groups can, which groups um, have that as a commuting graph? In other words, um, how, uh, so like given a graph of a known group, um, are there other non-isomorphic groups that have the same graph? Um, and it is also just a, a question, given a graph, um, is that the commuting graph of some group, for example? There definitely is a, a field of study, but not one that I've worked on. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I have one question. I think the other two questions answered other questions I had. But are, are the graphs that you get from these constructions interesting from a graph theoretic perspective? Like, do, for instance, any graphs coming from here solve conjectures in graph theory or provide examples of graphs that uh, we didn't know whether existed or not? That is a very good question. Uh, not something I've looked at at all. Um, so, I, I mean, so like, for example, uh, I've used uh, this example of D12 because it's a very small group. And so it's like one that can be represented visually. Like as soon as you get to much larger groups, you know, they become huge and impossible to look at visually at least. Uh, but again, I, I guess, I, um, you know, all known graphs, like all, all graphs that can be represented visually, I guess, are known. So that wouldn't be directly related. But yeah, uh, it's a very interesting question that I haven't thought about at all. Yeah. Do you, do you have any thoughts about like what, because I, I haven't thought about this question at all. Do you have like any thoughts about what kinds of graphs are like not known? <laughs> I guess that's- Well, I'm not, exact, I'm not exactly a graph theorist, but uh, from the small amount of study I've done in graph theory, like sometimes people will pose, does there exist a graph with like such and such properties mm -hmm. relating to its coloring or diameter or connectedness or something. And I was wondering if maybe uh, people 
wanted to study these graphs because they gave interesting examples relating to, I don't know, conjectures in graph theory or something. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have anything specific. Okay, it's a very interesting question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, so, so I'm guessing you study the graph, you, you're mainly studying the graph theoretic properties as they give you information about the groups themselves. Yeah, I mean, I, I study them personally because I, I think math is fun and it's good to learn more things about them. But like, if you have, if you force me to give it up, like say why I'm doing it for like a research proposal or something, yeah. then yeah, I would primarily say to, as I said, um, they give us ways of understanding the groups and also differentiating between individual groups and families of groups. Yeah, well, I guess kind of the like uh, opposite question to what I just asked is uh -huh. uh, by proving properties about these graphs, do you, are there any kind of general theorems you get about the, the groups instead? Uh, sure. Well, like just as, yeah. a, very, uh, as a very basic example, uh, going back here. Uh, so something I forgot to mention actually is that, so um, in the in for finite two theorem groups here, when we were talking about this, mm -hmm. um, by Bernstein's period that you could the B theorem, any group that has order divisible by at most two primes is soluble. So this implies that any finite two two group is soluble. So if you like, you know, you're given some group and somehow you're able to construct the non-commuting non-generating graph without knowing what group it is, you know, it's finite, for example, and you get a two two group, you get a graph with two components of lambda two, then you know that that group must be soluble, for example, mm -hmm. which is a very basic example. Mm -hmm. I don't know how useful that would be, but yeah. it's true. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Saul. You're welcome. Another one from me, like usually like, all these definitions, they are working with graphs, but are there works also being done in relation to, how do you say, when you're connecting, for example, triangles or higher dimensional figure, figures, mm -hmm. like instead of talking about uh, two tuples of elements, talking about triples or so on? Yeah, um, so uh, if you have a hypergraph, you can um, have uh, edges that contain more than two vertices. I haven't looked at those myself, um, but so for example, uh, if we go back to just uh, so what I said here. So I, I said here that um, the generating graph is only interesting with these two here, because if the group is not too generated, then there are no generating pairs. But if you're looking at the hypergraph, the hypergenerating graph, then you could, of course, um, you know, join three, have three vertices in one edge if they form a three generating set for the group. Um, there are also graphs that have been defined, for example, by Andrea Lucchini, where you join, uh, so if the group is not too generated, you join two elements by an edge in a graph, if they are a subset of a minimal generating set or a generating set of minimal size, those go two different graphs depending on what definition you choose. So there are ways of tackling these groups uh, to go from like this, because yeah, edges in a graph correspond to a pair of vertices, but there are various ways of dealing with the case where you want more than two vertices in the subset. Yeah, but uh, the question is also, is it like a useful question? Like, uh, are there things that were sort of using this, or? It's uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, there have been things solved using this, but um, so like as far as I know, so like th these graphs, so like the graph that I was just talking about, introduced by Andrea Lucchini and so on, have been only studied very recently, and not much is known about them. Uh, but personally, I think they're interesting. Whether or not they have applications, I'm sure they do. I just don't know what they are. But they're interesting. Yeah, yeah, not true. Uh, thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, I think with this we can uh, we'll, uh, thank you again for the talk. Uh, Thanks for having me. And I'll, I will stop the recording now.